thank you. Thank you all for being here. I know you're all busy, and I appreciate your being here. And it's exciting to get to talk to you <coughs> about gratitude because you're all at Google. So you are all grateful every day because the rest of us who are not at Google know that you work in the best place in the entire world. You get free food. I took some on my way in. You get free coffee and tea. You get everything, right? And so when you go home at night, and maybe something didn't go quite as perfectly that day as you had hoped. Maybe somebody annoyed you, or maybe something didn't work out right. And you tell your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife or mother or father or whatever stage of life you're at, you complain to somebody, and they say, oh, for heaven's sakes, you work at Google. You know, I don't want to hear it. You're lucky. Realize how lucky you are. So most of us are pretty lucky, right? And we know that we should feel grateful all the time. Um, but we don't. And let's just admit it, we don't. And I know how you feel if there are those days that you go home and you're not feeling so grateful and everybody's telling you that you should. Um, because it's how I felt too. As that nice introduction said, I, I've had a great career. I was the editor-in-chief of um, Parade, which was at the time the biggest magazine in America. I've been a TV producer. I've had lots of fun things to do. I have a lovely husband. I have two great kids. But for me, it started on a New Year's Eve. And I was standing at a party on a New Year's Eve. And I don't know how you guys feel on New Year's Eve or how you felt on this past New Year's Eve, but I'm always pretty sure on New Year's Eve that everybody in the world is having a better time than I am. <laughs> and I, we turned on the TV at this party, and you know the ball in New York was about to fall. And I'm sure you have the same experience with whatever falls or screams or goes up in smoke in London. And and I stood there and I thought, OK, it's been a perfectly nice year. There's nothing bad that's happened this year. I knew I had a perfectly nice life. But what was going to happen in the coming year that was really going to excite me? What was going to happen in the coming year so that I could be standing at that same New Year's Eve a year from now and thinking, wow, what a fabulous year this was? And I went through various things in my head. And I realized, well, I probably wasn't going to win the lottery, but if I did win the lottery, I'd probably complain that the taxes were too high. <laughs> I probably wasn't going to move to Hawaii, but if I did, I'd probably get a sunburn and be unhappy about that. And basically, I realized that whatever happens in the course of the year, it's really not the events that happen that make you happy or unhappy, but it's your own attitude towards them. And so that's when I decided to challenge myself for the coming year to see if I could spend a year living more gratefully and see if that would really make a difference. Now, if it sounds like I was incredibly smart on that New Year's Eve to know that it's not events that make you happy, it's, it's your attitude towards them, I had actually been working on gratitude for a year or so. Um, I had been asked by the John Templeton Foundation, which is a big, wonderful international foundation, to, to do a survey for them on gratitude. And um, I had done it. It was just sort of a, a project for them. But then the results started coming in. And they were really, really interesting. Um, where something like, if you ask people, um, does gratitude make you happier? Are grateful people happier? Something like 90% of people say, absolutely, gratitude makes you happier. And if you say, are you grateful for your family and friends? They say, sure. You know, again, 85, 90% say, of course I'm grateful for my family and friends. And then you say, do you express gratitude? And then the number plunges. And then all of a sudden, it's at like 40%. So I started calling that the gratitude gap. And I, you know, I'm a journalist. I went on TV. I was talking about it. I wrote articles about it. And it took till that New Year's Eve, though, for me to realize that I was as guilty of that gratitude gap as anybody else. And what I mean by that gratitude gap is that we know there's something that's going to make us happier, but we don't do it. And what's holding us back? Why don't we? Um, I think there are lots of reasons, and um, we'll get to some of those. Um, what I found in the course of that year, let me just jump ahead to the end of the year, is that by being grateful, by trying to turn things around on a daily basis, by trying to find the positive in any kind of event, I ended up, oddly enough, with the best year of my life. And nothing special happened that year. I can't tell you any fabulous event that happened in that year other than that I wrote that book. Um, and yet, it was such a wonderful year. And it was because my attitude towards things made me so much happier. 
And I think that that's what I'd like to be able to share with you is the ways that you can start to feel happier by using gratitude in that way. Um, so in the course of the year, I dealt with relationships, I dealt with family, I dealt with all sorts of things, but one of the things that I dealt with was work. And um, since we're all here at Google, and I know you all work, um, I just thought we could talk about gratitude at work for a couple of minutes. And I, I think gratitude at work has two sides to it. One is appreciating the job that you have, and the other is being appreciated at your job. So let's start with the first one, which is appreciating the job that you have. So all of you remember probably when you applied for this job and then how thrilled you were when you got it, right? You got the job at Google. That was really great. And now it's the job that you have. So you probably don't wake up every single morning grateful for the fact that you have this job. Um, psychologists call it habituation, which means you get used to stuff. Um, you want something and you want it. You want this job, you want a diamond ring, you want a Porsche, you want, uh, you want something and then you get it and it becomes the background of your life. It just becomes the baseline. And once we're at the baseline, what do we want except the next step, right? So we sort of stop noticing where we are. We stop noticing what we actually have. And that's true, frankly, with a job. It's true with a spouse, with a partner, with, uh, with all sorts of things. And um, at one point, I was calling it the Porsche in the garage syndrome, you know, because I know so many people who are desperate for a Porsche or, or and they just think it's going to change their life. They're going to be so happy. And then they get the Porsche and that first day they're driving through Los Angeles and they're so excited and they're showing it off. And then after a while, you know, the traffic is still lousy and they got to change the oil and it's just the car they drive to work every day. So that becomes the Porsche in the garage. And who's excited about the car that they have in the garage? So what do you do at that point? Well, I guess you could get a Lamborghini. And uh, you work at Google, maybe you could get a Lamborghini. Um, but you get the point that you can always up the ante. You can always try to up the ante. But probably what's going to happen is you up the ante and you end up feeling the same as, as when you started. So if you realize that, that's the point at which you go, OK, so how do I stop and appreciate where I am right now? And again, I asked the question before, why don't we do that? And I think at work, one of the reasons we don't do that, excuse me, is that we're afraid that if we're grateful for what we have, we're not going to get any more. Right? We have this image that you have to be miserable. You have to be a little, a little unhappy where you are in order to want to get to the next step. That somehow we have this sense of ambition as being something that means like, I can't, I'm just going to grab that water, that means that I can't be satisfied where I am right now. I have to keep wanting to go on to something else. Well, one of the things I discovered is that gratitude and ambition actually play very nicely together. That when you're grateful for what you have, when you appreciate what you have, you're happier. You're a lot more fun to be around. People like to be with positive people, right? And you're much more likely to be able to, to take that next step. And because you feel good about yourself, you're much more likely to be able to take that next step. So I think that's so important to realize that gratitude isn't a pat on the back. And gratitude isn't just a platitude. I, I, I'm from New York. I am neither soft nor sappy. And I knew that if gratitude feels really soft and sappy to a lot of people. But I knew that if at the end of the year it was just a, that pat on the back, it was just my saying to myself or to others, oh, yeah, 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 everything was fine, that wasn't going to be right. But much more important is that we're able to spin our own lives, right? We're able to spin how something happens to look at the bright side of it or to look at the, the negative side of it. And we tend to be really good at looking at the negative side. So if 10 good things happen to you in a day and one bad thing happens, what's the one you remember when you go home at night? What's the one you tell your significant other about over dinner? You're unlikely to go through the nine fabulous things that happened, but you're probably going to focus on the one negative thing that happened. Now, I, again, there's 
there's a reason for this. Some psychologists say that it may be hardwired, that we may be hardwired to focus on the negative, and for a really good reason, that our ancestors in the jungles, if they were picking berries, they really needed to know which was the poisonous berry, right? Knowing which were the nine tasty berries didn't matter that much, but knowing which was the one poisonous berry was really important. Otherwise, they did not become our ancestors. So we've moved beyond that, though. And yeah, it's important to know where the poisonous berry is. It's important to know where the problems are, because you want to be able to do something about it. But just focusing on those and not knowing where the nine tasty berries are is probably not the best way to have a happy life, either. Um, so how do you do that? What are some of the specifics that you can do to make yourself appreciate it? <coughs> well, one of the women that I spoke to as I was writing the book um, uh, runs a very large profit uh, in, in, in the US. And she has a couple of kids. And she was, as many of you are, overwhelmed by work and busy at home and never felt like she was doing enough for, for anybody. And she told me that she came up with a solution. She had a 20-minute drive home. and that she decided that for those 20 minutes in the car on the way home every day, she was only going to go over the good things that had happened that day. She was only going to let herself think about the positive things, the nice thing that somebody had said, the success that she'd had at work, the, the achievement that she'd had. And she wasn't going to think about the problems. Now, there were problems at work. We have problems at work. Thinking about the positive doesn't make them go away. It doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. It doesn't mean you're not going to have to still solve them the next day. And I think that's the other thing that we forget about. We think, like, if I'm obsessing about it, it's going to get better. It's not going to get better if there's nothing you can do about it that night. Um, so thinking about the positive things is possibly going to put you in a better frame of mind in order to be able to do, to do better the next day. Another simple thing that you can do. Um, people talk about keeping a gratitude journal. That sounds kind of onerous, right? We all work really hard. You write. You're on your computer all day. Do you really want to have to go home at night and keep a gratitude journal? Um, I think of it as keeping a little piece of paper next to your bed where you scroll down one thing. Scroll down one thing before you go to bed at night that is about something good that happened that day. And I know it sounds really simple and it sounds really small, but you would be so surprised how knowing that you're going to do that changes your entire day. OK, so give yourself a week. Tell yourself you're going to do it for a week. Who can't do something for a week? And you're going to wake up in the morning, and you'll have your cup of coffee. And you'll go, oh, grateful for my cup of coffee. That's it. I don't have to worry about this for the rest of the day. I've got what I'm going to write about. OK, that's fine. You've also put yourself in a little bit of a positive framework at 9 o'clock in the morning. And that's not a bad thing. Or maybe it gets to be 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you go, oh, gosh, I haven't been grateful for anything today. And I'm going to have to come up with something tonight. What should I be grateful for? And maybe you go, you know what? I'm going to be grateful for that piece of chocolate that I have right here. Because <laughs> why not? You know, and I'm actually going to stop and appreciate this piece of chocolate and appreciate that it's really tasty and that it was out there. And well, that's kind of a cool thing that I, that I have this piece of chocolate. And I'm going to appreciate it in a slightly different way. Or maybe you just look out and the sun is down now. But when I walked in here, the sun was just absolutely beautiful on the buildings across the way. And maybe you, you see it every day, but maybe you actually pause and think, I'm going to be grateful today that I get to see this beautiful, beautiful sight. And again, it's such a small thing. It's not interfering with your day very much. It's not interfering with your job very much. But it's putting you in a slightly different frame of mind. It's such a small thing that you can do for yourself. And as you start to do it more and more, you'll find how simple it is to actually do in circumstances that are difficult or, or frustrating. Um, I flew in from New York the other night. Uh, it was a great flight. We got in. I got to customs or passport control. And there was an hour and a half line there. There was really nothing I could do about that. I said to my husband, do you think I could have a fit and they would put me through first? He said, no, I think they would put you in jail. Um, so we're standing in line, and you know, 30 minutes goes by, and there's not a lot. You know, you're tired at that point, and you're a little bit grumpy. And, and I thought, no, I don't want to start my trip here being grumpy. I'm excited to be in London. So I said to my husband, let's play the gratitude game. He's, he's done this enough now. <laughs> <laughs> I go, all right, Miss Gratitude, go ahead. And, you know, and I said, I'm so excited that we're in London. 
this is really cool. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I'm going to get to talk at Google. And it became a joke, of course, and we sort of, you know, but it made us laugh. And it made us both say, what's the big deal? We're standing in line, you know, okay. And there's nothing we can do about it. Now, that's the other thing about gratitude. If there's something you can do about the situation, do it. <laughs> you know, gratitude is not meant to turn you into a sap. Um, do anything that you can. But so often in life, we're in situations where we can't do something about it. And all we can do, all we can control is our attitudes. What's surprising, I think, also about being grateful, about knowing that you can do that, is how it gives you a bit of control back in your life. Because sometimes when you're in a situation like you're standing in line, or you're caught in traffic, or the tube is late, or whatever the problem is, you just feel helpless. And that's part of the frustration. There's nothing you can do. You just feel helpless about it. Um, and if you allow yourself that gratitude moment, if you allow yourself to say, I don't have to make this irritating. I don't have to have this something that frustrates me. It gives you a bit of control back. And that has a really, really surprising effect on you. So I said at the beginning that there are two sides to gratitude at work. One is appreciating your job, and the other is being appreciated. And um, as I was doing the book and as I was talking to people, I was stunned by how bad we are at expressing thanks at work or having, ourselves, having people say thank you to us at work. Um, and it's such a surprise because you know, every Harvard Business Review article now, every book, every psychologist who writes about this subject talks about the fact that most of us are motivated of course, we want to have a good paycheck. That's the, that's the baseline. We understand that. But most of us are really motivated by feeling that the work we do is important and feeling that the work we do matters, feeling that we're doing something that people will appreciate. And as I was writing this book and I was talking to executives, one after another would tell me, no, 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 we say thank you here with a paycheck. And you know it's an old it's an old line that people have been using. I think if you know the TV show Mad Men, they used that sh that line in the '60s. Um, and and I finally got to the point where I wanted to say, no, you don't say thank you with a paycheck. You say thank you with thank you. You say we're paying you with a paycheck. Um, and I know at Google, and I even mentioned Google in the book, uh, the the uh, one of the mantras the from the HR people is we appreciate the people who work here and we want people to be happy. And, um, and that's great, you know, and, and I hope that that corporate ethos does indeed um, exist and that you, that you do feel it. Um, but everybody's an individual, and there are probably some of you who have people who you report to or who, who you deal with who aren't quite as good as that, at, at that, and who, you know, have high expectations. And so who have the feeling that if I have high expectations, you'll work harder. Um, they're wrong. <laughs> um, that survey that I, that I did um, for the book, we found that 81% of people said that they would work harder for a grateful boss. And 90% of people said that they thought a grateful boss would be more successful because people would rally around him or her. And really, nobody succeeds. Nobody gets to the top on their own. So those are two really, really important numbers to me. Um, that people will work harder if, there are pre if, if, if you're the boss, if there are people who work for you or report to you, people will work harder if you say thank you to them. And you're more likely to be successful. Um, so once we realize that, there's pretty much no reason at all um, that we wouldn't be grateful. And you know, I, I had the experience, um, I, was, I was in New York uh, not a couple of months ago, and. Um, I was having dinner with a friend of mine who is um, a partner at a big, big New York law firm. And he made a call during dinner, and uh, he was obviously speaking to an associate, and he said to him, I need that on my desk uh, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And he hung up, and I said to my friend, um, does that mean that guy's going to have to work all night? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, are you going to say thank you to him when you go in tomorrow morning? And he said, no, it's his job. And I, now I'd written a book on gratitude, okay? He knew it. <laughs> and I said, okay, here's an idea. Why don't you stop on your way into the office and buy a cup of coffee and put it on his desk and say, 
I appreciate that you had to work all night. You don't even have to say thank you. Just say, I appreciate that you had to work all night. And my friend got it, and he laughed, and he said, yeah, the coffee's a good idea because, uh, because at least he'll stay up for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, sometimes it really is those small things, and um, those small things that remind us that we're in an environment where we need to support each other. And um, there was uh, there's a CEO, actually, he was the CEO of Campbell's Soup. His name was Doug Conant. And he was the CEO there from, I think, 2001 to about for 10 years. So probably he left a few years ago. And um, when Doug got to Campbell's, the company was not doing that well. It was, it was uh, you know, it's a Fortune 500 company in the United States, but it was, it was not, you know what Campbell's is, right? It makes soups. It's international, isn't it? Um, and uh, it, it was um, not doing well. And Doug's job was to come in and turn it around. Now, he's a really smart businessman. And um, I'm not taking away any of the business side of things, which I completely don't understand, but I'm sure he did brilliantly. But he also told me that one of the things he did there was that every single day he wrote six handwritten thank you notes to somebody in the company. And it wasn't just to the you know, executives who worked for him. He would send it off to somebody in a, uh, you know, in a plant in, in some small town or to the guy who's on the assembly line somewhere or to the, to the guys who are, who are packing the, the boxes. And he actually had somebody on his staff whose whole job was to find things that people had done good in the company so that he could send them the thank you notes. And um, you could multiply it out. I didn't, but he told me writing six thank you notes six days a week for 10 years, he figures he wrote about 30,000 thank you notes. And the twist on that story is that um, uh, one of the last years that he was at the company, he was in a terrible, terrible car accident. And um, he was in the uh, ICU, the emergency unit, for, for a couple of weeks. And they actually weren't sure that he was going to survive. And he started getting notes in from around the world. And his wife was sitting on his bedside and reading him the notes. And as you can imagine, so many of them were from people who worked for him, from people who were writing to him and saying, you don't know me, but six years ago, you sent me a thank you note. And my family was so proud, and it's been on our refrigerator ever since. And so I've always felt like you're a member of the family, and now my thoughts and prayers are with you, and I hope you get well. And Doug was so incredibly moved by that. And he hadn't written his thank you notes, figuring that it was all going to come back around, but it does. And putting out those expressions of gratitude, giving that gratitude, really, really makes a difference. Um, if you don't have a boss or an executive or a CEO who's doing it, um, what do you do? Well, guess what? Gratitude can start anywhere. Um, I think another problem we have is that we sometimes think that we shouldn't be grateful to our colleagues, right? I said in that survey, we're, we only say thank you to our colleagues 10% of the time. Because again, it goes back to what we were talking about before, that sense of ambition, and we're all a little bit competitive, and if we say she did such a good job, does it mean I didn't do as good a job? It really doesn't, you know? We all do so much better, and I'm sure your corporate structure here supports that. We all do so much better when we're supporting each other and when we're collegial and when we recognize what other people have done. Um, it just makes for a better atmosphere. So if you're not getting it from the top, you can start it anywhere. Um, and you can appreciate the people who work with you. And yeah, I'm sure there'll be a jerk somewhere who tries to stab you in the back with that. That's going to happen. But that's not, not been my experience that that's the general uh, way things, things work. The people, people recognize people who are genuinely appreciative of them and of what they're doing and who care about, about giving that way. Um, another way that gratitude works really interestingly is with a spouse, a partner, a boyfriend, or a girlfriend. You know, I was talking about habituation before and the sense of people slipping back into the background and becoming the baseline. Um, and in that survey that we did, again, um, we found that people were more likely to say thank you to the barista at the coffee shop or the guy who delivers the mail than they were to their own spouse or partner. So what's up with that? Well, 
I think the answer is that you don't really expect that much from the barista at the coffee shop, right? And if he makes you a nice cappuccino, that's worth a thank you. Um, whereas for the person that we are connected to, we have pretty high expectations. Um, and we're also really, most of us are really good at knowing how our partners could be so much better if only they would listen to us. Um, and so we tend to focus on that. We tend to be very good at reminding them of all of the things that they could do better. And the first month of my year of gratitude, I decided that I was going to try to notice my husband a little bit more. Um, and that I was going to try to say thank you to him for the things that he probably did all the time, but that we'd been married a long time and that I'd stopped noticing. So it started the first weekend and we were driving up to, uh, we live in New York City, we have a, a, a house in Connecticut also, and we were driving up to our house as we do most Friday nights and we, we pulled in and um, I said, thank you for driving. And he said, I always drive. <laughs> and I said, I know you always drive, but you know, I'm a lousy driver, it's snowing, it's miserable, it's dark, and I appreciate that, that we, you got us here. And he didn't say anything. This was the very, very beginning of my gratitude year, so he didn't quite know what I was doing yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we spent the whole weekend that way. And I thanked him for, for all sorts of little things that, that he did, or told him he looked great, or thanked him for fixing something. He's a fix-it kind of guy. And, and he was just sort of taking it in and kind of not sure who he was living with this weekend. <laughs> and then it got to Sunday night, and we had dinner, and he said, thank you for making dinner. And I said, I always make dinner. Um, but um, the vibe had changed. You know, all of a sudden we were noticing each other and appreciating each other in a different way. And, um, and I was planning only to do that for a month, may I say. Um, but it was such a dramatic change that certainly that appreciating and being grateful and saying thank you to my spouse really, really lasted in a very dramatic way and gave us a pretty extraordinary year. And on that second New Year's, my book is written from New Year's to New Year's, and on that second New Year's I told him that I wanted the, the last chapter of the book was going to be New Year's Eve. And, um, and so he came up with all sorts of things that we could do to have a great New Year's. You know, no pressure, it's going to be the last chapter of the book, give me a perfect New Year's Eve. And, and I said, no, no, I really just want to be at our house, in our, in our country house, just with you, just a fire and a bottle of champagne. And so, again, a little bit of pressure. But then it got to be quarter of 12, and we'd had a wonderful night. And again, we, you know, turn on the TV as the previous year, and the ball is about to drop in New York. And shame, shamefully, I started to cry. And my husband said, oh, no, I thought I did such a good job tonight. What's wrong? Why are you unhappy? And I said, no, this has just been such a great year, and I don't want it to end. Um, and he said, and I don't actually say this, admit this in the book, he said, you actually could be nice next year, too? <laughs> um, but um, I, it, it really was so powerful to me of how we had reconnected that year and how good we felt about each other. And, um, Again, uh, you know, everybody's at different stages in relationships and different stages in life. But um, if you're, it, it's sort of like a job. If you can't find reasons to be grateful to your job, if you can't find one or two or three things that you can write down right now about your job and put in your top drawer and hold on to them for those days that you're feeling lousy, then you probably should leave your job. But and it's the same with a spouse. If you can't find one reason, or two reasons, or three reasons to be grateful, then you're probably, or, then you're probably with the wrong person. But for many of us who are in relationships, we just forget to do that. And, you know, and, and the same with the job. Um, take that piece of paper out tonight. Write down two or three reasons why you're excited and grateful and happy that you're here. And have them there as that little backup, as a reminder on those lousy days that you can pull it out and go, Yep, reasons to be grateful and add to it as often as you can. And I think you'll, you'll be surprised to discover what, what a huge difference it can make. So I'm going to um, stop talking and um, see if there are any questions I can take from you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? 
so I think people naturally have different levels of uh, gratefulness. Mm -hmm. Some people are more grateful, some people are less grateful naturally. Did you find uh, any patterns between like female and male? Some cultures were more grateful than other cultures. Did you do any of any analysis of the sort? Yeah, um, that's a great question from a data person, clearly. <laughs> um, uh, we did, and in that survey, um, women tend to be more grateful than men. Um, and interestingly, women are more grateful in every situation um, except at home. And at home, men tend to be more grateful to their significant other than women are. Now, it may be that women do so much more at home that men should be more grateful to them. <laughs> I wouldn't draw that conclusion because I'm sure your data may not support it. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I worried at first that, that gratitude was a, you know, too much of a women subject uh, because it is something that women tend to think about more, but really not. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that for men, particularly at work, are starting to get the idea and starting to realize it and starting to realize that there are ways that, um, that they can make themselves happier. Um, uh, interestingly, also in that survey, um, millennials were the least grateful. Um, uh, and um, uh, people actually younger than you um, had probably the biggest problems. Maybe some of you are younger than I think, but um, people in the 18 to 24 range were really had a hard time with gratitude. And I think for a lot of them, it's because um, they really want to be independent. They really want to be able to do everything on their own, and they can't yet. And so we did some focus groups, and there would be some, you know, some kids who had just graduated college who, who would say, like, well, my parents are paying for my first apartment, and my parents are doing this and that for me, and I feel really guilty that I can't do it myself, and the guilt kind of outweighs the gratitude. So I think there's a point where, where it's hard to be grateful sometimes in those circumstances because it makes you feel like you're not as strong as you want to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I sort of understand that. But... Um, uh, I think it's I think it's really important at any age, and um, I, I think the other thing is that you don't want gratitude to be something that you only see in the rearview mirror. You know, um, uh, you don't want you don't want to be looking back in ten years and say, why didn't I appreciate that? Why didn't I realize how wonderful that was? Why was I always so busy running and doing, excuse me, doing this and that, that that I couldn't stop and, and pause to appreciate it? I think sometimes that's a really good perspective. Um, when you're miserable about something, uh, particularly at your job, stop and think how you're going to feel about that in 10 years, in five years, in two years. Um, think how you'd feel about it if you didn't have the job, right? I often say that to people when they're complaining to me about their work, their boss, that they're working so hard. I say, would you be happy? You know, put yourself in the mindset of if you didn't have that job, what would you miss? You know, maybe you'd miss the free food. Maybe you'd miss your, you, the, the, the chance to, to do something important. Maybe you'd miss your, your colleagues. Um, and if you can remember that, if you can think about the things that you would really want to have again, I think that can really help, help put you back in, in the mindset that, uh, that's so helpful. Yes? Um, I have a really cranky grandmother. You have what? Mm -hmm. If there's any tactics you can do where you could speak to someone who's older to try and shift them from being friendly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question and it's really hard. Um, I, I, you know, I had it with my mom who was not a grateful person and, um, and I couldn't, uh, I, I would tell her what I was doing and, and she would always have a, another reason. You know, I would say exactly that. Look at your children, look at your grandchildren, isn't this wonderful? And, and it would always be a yes, but. Um, and that's hard, you know, and, it's, and it's, it's hard because you see somebody making themselves unhappy, right? And, and I guess you can try it, and I think you should, and I think it's a really kind thing to do for the person to point it out to them because, you know, nobody wants to be unhappy. Your grandmother probably doesn't wake up every morning and say, I think I'd like to be unhappy today. Um, but she doesn't know how to do it. She doesn't have the tools. And so maybe it will be helpful to her for you to try to do that and for you to try to give her that advice. 
And if, even if it's not, it's going to be really helpful for you because it's going to make you in some ways more sympathetic to her attitude because you're going to see the other side and you're not going to be constantly irritated at it. You're going to see, hey, you know, and you're also going to say, I don't want to be like that. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes a negative role model is okay too. Um, and, you know, to see somebody who's, and I, I will warn you of one thing, that once you start doing this gratitude stuff, you get so irritated at people who don't get it. You become like what, I never smoked, but what I imagine reformed smokers must be, like they want to rip cigarettes away from everybody. Um, you get like that. And when people are like your grandmother, or I have a couple of friends who would be always complaining about things, and, you know, I would just, like, stamp my foot and go, would you stop that? Yes, there's this terrible, horrible commute that you have to have, you know, of 20 minutes, but you go to a job that you love, and you're in a beautiful building, and you've had this job for a long time, and, um, you know, I would just be so frustrated by hearing, uh, by hearing complaints, um, and, uh, but, but I think that's okay, and I think that, you know, a lot of people start to come around also once you start pointing it out to them. And once you start saying, let's just stop and let's just stop and look at something po from a positive perspective and uh, makes a difference. Anybody else? Yes. Did your research ever look at um, or has it looked at the role of technology in um, gratitude and happiness and particularly for social media? I think for me, I feel like there's a big resurgence in people being grateful and, and using the hashtag on social media. But I'm really interested in knowing Well, there has been, uh, there were a few big articles that came out about social media and um, causing, and I forget what the phrase was they were using, but basically saying that it makes you unhappy because you see everybody else on Facebook posting their wonderful lives and you read their wonderful lives and say, why is my life not that good? <laughs> and may I say I thought that research was ridiculous because we're all grown-ups here, right? We're all reading Facebook and know that our friends are posting positive things. And it made me say, well, let's use social media to make ourselves happier then. Because it's actually kind of a good thing, if you think about it. If you're posting on Facebook or wherever you guys like to post, um, you probably are putting up the good picture on Instagram, right? You're not putting up the picture where you're crying. You're putting up the picture where you look happy. You're putting up the picture where your arm is around your boyfriend. And, you know, so what are you doing? You're essentially finding reasons to be grateful. And you're putting it out there. And I actually think that's kind of a wonderful thing. And I think if you look at, again, maybe it's just a turn on how to look at social media. If you look at it that way, that's a really positive use of social media. And, and in that way, I think that um, you could, you, we do it naturally uh, because we like to put out the best look of ourselves to, to other people. But we're also putting out the best look of ourselves to ourselves. And I've, I've actually suggested to a lot of families who are worried about their kids and I've said, use social media for good. So pick a day. Make, make Tuesday Family Gratitude Day, and everybody in the family takes a picture that day and posts it on Instagram of something that they're grateful for. And you don't even have to tell. If you're embarrassed about the hashtag gratitude, you don't even have to tell everybody else. But everybody in the family knows that. And it becomes like a nice little bonding, and it becomes a way that, that, you, can, that you can use it in a positive way. But, um, but I think if we realize that in, in a funny way, social media and I agree with you, all the hashtag gratitudes can be, you know, a little bit much and we don't necessarily want to read every day why somebody else is grateful. Um, uh, though I will tell you that there is one person um, who works at my publishing company and I can't tell you his name because I don't know his name. I met him at a very dark party when my book came out and um, he told me that um, he uh, uh, sends out three reason, texts out every morning, and he actually had been an AA, an Alcoholics Anonymous, which uses gratitude a lot, and that for the last year he had been texting every morning to a bunch of friends three reasons why he was grateful, going to be grateful that day. And I said, well, I'd love to get that. That would be really interesting. And this was last May, and I put my phone number into his phone, and I have now, every morning since then, <laughs> gotten these. And um, it's actually kind of wonderful because I actually don't know who he is. I would not know him if he were sitting here. Um, but I, 
I am so inspired, and I sometimes feel like I'm cheating, like I'm not writing my own gratitudes, I'm just getting his in, but it actually kind of starts the day in a nice way, and he's actually a lovely writer, and he doesn't write those silly things like grateful for coffee, grateful for, you know, he, he'll, he, he's thoughtful in, in a much deeper level, and so I think that there is a way that we can share positive feelings, positive viewpoint, say, you know, he'll, he'll send out, I'm grateful because it's Monday, and I get to start the week with a fresh slate, and I know that I get to control today however I want it to be, and I get to control this week however I want it to be. And so I'm grateful that I have the chance to be positive, and I'm grateful that I have the chance to go forward and know that I can do that. And I'll go, yeah, you bet, that's right. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that we can use social media, uh, whatever formats that we like, um, in, in a very positive way that way. Yeah, so first off, thank you. Um, it's been it's fantastic. Um, but one of the things you sort of talk about, and you, uh, you know, you say gratitude can start from anywhere, and um, you, do, you just don't say it directly, but are you also saying that r rather than expecting other people to be grateful or trying to encourage them to be grateful, the act of being grateful to them yourself is a trigger and helps them to be grateful? Do, do you see that happening? I do think that's the case, um, and at least in part because you can't make somebody else grateful, right? You can't make your grandmother grateful. You can't ask somebody to appreciate your work, um, but you can stop and be grateful yourself, um, and then maybe it becomes a little less important what somebody else says to you. Uh, becomes the outside circumstances, the outside events become a little less important, and your gratitude comes from within, and your appreciation comes from within. And, and I do think it is contagious. I do think it's very hard to appreciate somebody else, say thank you to somebody else, without it coming back. Um, you know, try it at a store sometime. If you want, talk about cheating, like, I mean, you, you know, people who don't normally get appreciated, a store, a store clerk, the cashier, you know, give them a big smile and say, I really appreciate it, thanks for your help. And their attitude will completely change. You know, and the people who you just like naturally want to get irritated at, like the person at the bank who's unbelievably slow, and you want to go, could you count that foreign currency any slower for me? Um, and instead, you, you know, you, you say, thanks, it's been really busy here today, hasn't it? And I appreciate you doing that. And again, your attitude changes and their attitude changes. And, and I just think it's a very simple, simple exchange that you can do. Anyone ask one more question? <laughs> <laughs> um, in your year that you were gracious, uh, did you ever have circumstances or that you found um, someone who was probably unhappy in their life and took it out on you and you didn't think they deserved your gratitude? How do you deal with that? Well, that's interesting. Well, I'll tell you a story that may answer the question. Um, uh, I, I live in New York, and it was a very, happened to be a very snowy year uh, when I was writing th that book. As I said, I started in January. So it was maybe March, and there had been a horrible snowstorm. And I'm trudging through New York near my apartment, and um, somebody was shoveling snow. And he takes a big shovel full of snow, and he throws it back right onto me. And... I, of course, responded in the gracious way that you would expect me to with a large number of profanities, yelled at him to please be careful and pay more attention to what he was doing and how dare he do that. And I continued through the storm, you know, storming down the street. And then I paused and I thought, it's my year of gratitude. I'm not allowed to do that. And I literally stopped. I literally stopped. You know, I had snow all over me and brushed it off. And I thought, all right, what? How could I possibly be grateful in this circumstance? And I knew he hadn't seen me, so, you know, I wasn't. And, and I thought, all right, I'm grateful that this guy is out shoveling and I'm not. And I'm grateful that I live in a place where people actually are shoveling the sidewalk and taking care of it. And, you know, I'm grateful that this, I haven't slipped yet on the sidewalk. And, you know, and this poor guy is out there shoveling. And it made me feel so much better. You know, because when you are angry at somebody, when you do yell at somebody, you feel bad, right? And so I, I turned around and I walked back down the street and this poor man now looks up at me and, he, you know, first this lady has yelled at him, now she's coming back, what's she going to do? And I just called out and I said, 
thank you for shoveling. I really appreciate that you're keeping the area clear. And he must have thought I was a complete loon, you know? I mean, <laughs> who does this? Um, but I, I turned around and, and, you know, and continued on, and, and I felt so much better, right? And I don't know how he felt. Maybe he was just baffled by, by this, but, or maybe he did say, oh, that's nice. You know, she said, she said thank you. So I think you can always find a reason, and I, and I, think, it, and I think it goes back to what I, I said before, that other people aren't looking to be unhappy either. And if you can help them find a way to be happy, um, and if you can find something good that they did, maybe it can turn things around for both of you. Well, please join me in a massive thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. <laughs>